watching TV less than a month ago, I witnessed a, an a, Oh, I'm sorry, before we start, 688. 667. Or if you'd like to sing the other one. <laughs> watching TV less than a month ago, I witnessed an Iraqi exile in Dearborn, Michigan. And he told with deep emotion about his reaction to the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. And this Iraqi American spoke of the homeland of his fathers, the place where he knew a childhood before Saddam. He said, I watched as the monuments, I watched as the statues and the tributes to this madman were toppled. And I watched as a larger than life painting was feverishly destroyed by my former countrymen tasting their first tentative sips of freedom. And this man said almost instantaneously, it's time to return to the land of my birth and wipe the tears from the eyes of the orphans. He said, it's time to build new monuments. It's time to build new memorials. And as he said these things, I thought, oh, how we treasure monuments. How we treasure the pyramids and the new World Trade Center Memorial, the Jefferson Lincoln Memorials, the Vietnam Memorial. Everybody who's anybody has a biography somewhere lining a library shelf, but how do you choose the greatest memorial? How do you choose the tallest? Maybe it's the oldest. Maybe it's the most read. Maybe it's the best remembered. Maybe that's the way we do it, Brother Barry. But I found within chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Joshua, the most exciting accounts of the monuments and remembrance of this second great division of the Old Testament. And before you leave the auditorium this morning, you will perhaps have a better appreciation than ever before about those things with which God has blessed us. The priceless significance of memory the ability to remember, our capacity to look beyond those things that are past and reflect not on all things, as Paul said he was forgetting those things behind in Philippians, but on the other hand, those things which we must remember as Christians. And just as God had demonstrated his miraculous power in bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and deposited them on dry land, he continued to show his love by parting the waters of the Jordan River to bring this people into the promised land of Canaan. Now, I think that any student of the Bible with even a cursory understanding of it would understand that simply crossing the Jordan into Canaan was a major crisis of faith because nearly 40 years before, Israel had faced this same crisis. But to escape into Sinai by this Red Sea and to invade Canaan by the Jordan became committed without the possibility of retreat and to face struggle against armies and against chariots, against fortified cities, that demanded a supreme measure of faith. Joshua 3.10. Because here a whole nation, a whole nation took the step to endanger their lives in total commitment to God. The promised land is where their wandering ceased. The promised land is where their building began. It was there that Israel began to build houses and to destroy their tents while they had been in this other place. Nothing was conquered. Nothing was acquired. But in the promised land, the men of Israel would rise up to confront enemies and subdue them with conquest. This must have been an exciting time. Folks, these are not fairy tales. These things really happened on this earth thousands of years ago. And it must have been an anxious time for the faithful because God's promise to Abraham is just about ready to be fulfilled. The hand, land flowing with milk and honey is within their grasp. Brethren, if you want the victory, please hear me. You have to be ready to take that step through the wilderness. Oh, how that applies to us today. Let me say it again. It's not ever easy to gain the victory because victory belongs on the other side of the wilderness. You have to be willing to go through a time of confusion 
You have to go through a time of gut-wrenching nervousness to get on the other side of this wilderness. Michelangelo was once asked how he produced masterpiece after masterpiece as the foremost sculptor ever. He said, the masterpiece is already there. He said, all I do is chip away the excess. And that's what we must do before you can become the masterpiece that God wants you to be, because you're fearfully and wonderfully made, you have to chip away the excess because all that has to be left on the other side of the wilderness. Now, a lot of you think that going through the wilderness phase is unfair. That's what takes the work here at school. That's what takes the work anywhere we want to do things that are worthwhile because it's the wilderness that rescues those who want to adapt the attitude of a servant. It's the wilderness that separates the saints from the ain'ts. We have to go through this phase. But I have to warn you that you must go through this wilderness to reach the will of God for your life because we're to cast all our cares on him and because he careth for us, we're told in 1 Peter. Remember Joshua and Caleb? Had they tried to enter this promised land utilizing their own strength, their own resources, they would have died in the wilderness. And even when life in that wilderness was dull, even when it was unappealing, they did not stop seeking God or his guidance. God continued to demonstrate his great power in separating the waters of the Jordan River. And the reason he did this was to simply give a preview of why Jesus Christ later gave himself. There's to be a separation. There's to be a setting apart of God's people. And the more I thought about it, Golgotha was specifically designed to separate us from the world. Jesus gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and of our Father, Galatians. If you spell the word evil backwards, you get the word live. And that's exactly what we do when we stay in the wilderness of sin. We live backwards from the way that God would have us to live. And so God gave himself through his son as a serve, as an escape out and away from those who are less than God would have them to be. Joshua said unto the people, sanctify yourselves. He said, set your part, apart yourselves, for tomorrow we'll, we will do wonders among you, Joshua 3, 5. We are to be different. It's always been the case. We're to be separated and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We're to be set apart in three different ways. Number one, we're to be set aside intellectually, we're told in Romans the 12th chapter, by not conforming to those things like politicians getting religion during campaign time. We're to be set apart by not conforming to those Enron WorldCom executive ethics. We're to be set apart by not conforming to Britney Spears' marriage models. We're to be set apart by not taking Colorado trips with Kobe Bryant. We're to be set apart from those news items in Fox and CNN show us every, every evening. We're to be set apart emotionally. Do all things without murmurings and disputing so that we may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. We're to be set apart, sanctified, philosophically. We're to be careful lest any man spoil you through philosophy and the vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Years ago, there was a television commercial that I've remembered for the last six or seven years. There was a sea of black umbrellas marching in one direction, and there was one red umbrella marching in the other. Do you know what was happening? It stood out just by standing apart. That's what you do at work. That's what you do at school. That's what you do during the holidays when you're the only member of your family that's a member of the body of Christ. You stand out by standing apart. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Well, what did he do? He gave himself up for it that he might sanctify it having cleansed it by the washing of the water with the word that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it might be holy and without blemish. The cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, separated us from the world. 
And it sanctified us as faithful Christians. It's a divine separation. And here's the important part. The will of God is that we, his people, be separated unto him for his purpose, not ours. We can't keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We're to be sanctified and set apart by giving everything that we have to him. By his spirit, through his word, and the one-time offering of Jesus Christ. He hath perfected forever those that are sanctified, we're told in Hebrews. Brother Thomas Warren. Brother Thomas Warren. The ultimate logician. He would have called this, Brother Perry, a positional truth. And all that means is a truth that God has made available to all humanity, whether or not we partake of it. But how do we transform in our lives this positional truth, this thing that God gives to us and we have to decide whether or not we take it, how do we transform this into a reality in our lives here on earth? Maybe this will help our understanding. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, for God hath not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. I checked my concordance. I checked at a lot of Bible dictionaries and several other things in my Hebrew text. Holiness comes from the same word as sanctified. And it's a Christian character trait that's developed by the continual application of God's word and our yielding to him through his, his, his word. Being holy doesn't happen involuntarily. I thought it did because I'd watched Christian television. Being holy takes effort on our part. Sanctification cannot be transferred between you and your mate or between your children and your parents. Sanctification is an individual possession and it's built up little by little as a result of obedience to the word of God. And it's found so many places in the New Testament. When the Israelites went through the wilderness, they arrived in the promised land. I said the promised land. And there they encountered the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and a multitude of other ites. They didn't want them to settle in their area, much less take control over it. But there they were. The Israelites had to do serious battle in order to claim the promised land that God had for them, the land to which God had called them, the land that God was going to help them to conquer. Why? Because they believed in him. Brethren, the promised land is not about real estate. The virgin birth is not about biology. This promised land was not a land that they were going to enter after their death. This was something that they were expected to conquer during their lifetime. And when we stepped in baptism through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that flows from the cross, we, every one of us here who are New Testament Christians, stepped into that place, that land that was promised to us by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the problem. Somebody else may be occupying that territory. Here's another problem. Someone else may be standing in your way. Someone else may be claiming your territory is theirs. But here's the advantage that you have. God has already bought it for you. He's already purchased it for you. We did not arrive in this promised land by ourselves. We got there with the help of so many other people. I am what little I am, which is not really that much in the whole scheme of things. Because of the help and the patience and the love of other people, much like you, 17, 18 years ago. I've always thought that when we discuss walking in strength, Ephesians and Joshua should be companion books because the book of Joshua presents a story of conquest, and there's Brother Paul begging again. Brother Paul beseeches the Ephesians to do more than simply hold the fort. He said to them, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. I think we're familiar with what the word inheritance means because he doesn't owe me a dime. He doesn't owe you a dime. We inherit 
that celestial city. Brethren, we are retaking occupied territory whenever we step through that wilderness. We're taking back what the prince of this world has stolen. And when you take over the territory of Satan, who goes about this earth seeking whom he may devour, you're casting the devil from your house because it's not his house. It's your house. You're expelling the devil from your neighborhood because it's your neighborhood. It's not his neighborhood. And you're driving the devil from your place of work. How do you do that? By the sheer force of your example. And you're ejecting the devil from your marriage here this morning at Brown Trail. So that you no longer pattern your marriage after the world, but after God's word. And you're forcing Satan, forcing him from your family so that he no longer has an influence over your children. Listen to me, fathers, especially those of you and mothers who have young children here, and for those of us who wish we could do it over. If you don't provide a strong role model as a Christian, believe me, there's an MTV, there's an m and there's a Girls Gone Wild, there's a rap artist appearing to our base instincts just waiting out there to take over. An example that would steal away those precious souls that we hold so dear. And whether those misguided, pitiful folks invite young boys to Neverland for an unusual weekend, sharing rides in a private zoo, and a private screening, and private beds, whatever. That will be the picture that our young folks, our most precious commodity, take into their adulthood. And just as those Israelites had to fight every inch of the way to take over that territory, which had been promised them, so will you. While you were in the wilderness of sin, out there in Egypt, the devil took over large areas. In fact, in some of us, he took almost all the area. And it's the sincere desire of God that we take back all that the devil has occupied. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I mentioned to you earlier that this invasion, and that's exactly what it was after that excellent lesson earlier this morning. They didn't have the possibility of retreat. That demanded supreme faith in living God. But how does faith show itself? I keep hearing about faith. How does it manifest itself? How did faith show itself by these children of God and how does it come to us? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How? Well, faith cometh by hearing. <laughs> and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yea. Verily I say, they sound went unto the, all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Now this great leader, Joshua, relayed God's instructions to the people concerning that river crossing. And he said to the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And in verses 14, 17 of chapter 3 of Joshua, the Israelites carried out the instructions given to them. Stay with me on this part. In a clear example of the inconsistent nature of Israel, we find those Israelites in this case listening very closely and executing very faithfully and trusting the Almighty in what Joshua told him to do. Now, I ask you why these people that had a history of closing their ears to the words of God would in this case follow closely what they had been told to do. Please hear me, and this has present day application. They had in Joshua a leader of unquestioned strength and unquestioned integrity who literally dominated this period of the history of Israel. And I think that the leaders of the Lord's church today, and I know it's difficult, and I think that the people within the Lord's church today would do well to study this great man and to determine how those people in his charge were able to be led so well. How? Leadership, just as those of you who have been in the service, leadership starts at the top. Leadership starts at the top. Oh, I love verse 9 of Joshua 3. Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. 
Jeremiah cried, O earth, hear the words of the Lord. Someone says, Oh, here it comes. Here comes that word again. Hereby ye shall know. You don't seem to understand, God. There's no, that, no way that we can, can know everything. Why would God give us a Bible? And then not give us the opportunity or the ability to understand it? The key to the whole matter is stated here. Hereby ye shall know. The Lord gives clear evidence upon which to base our knowledge every day of our lives if we will simply study to show ourselves approved unto him. Workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And he was about to show them the evidence, the miracle he was about to perform. The Jordan River is the place where Israel crossed over from the wilderness into the promised land and it was cold and it was high, but God helped them to cross over. Thousands of years later, today, as old fashioned as this may sound to you, you take that same book from which all these writings came and he will help you to cross over your limitations and reach your promised land through a study of his word. Remember the Jordan River, do you know where it ends? <laughs> it ends in the Dead Sea. And that's what has happened to us. We're dead to the world. We have been crucified to the world and nothing intimidates a dead man. Nothing out there should intimidate you here. That's what Christ did for us. We have to count our trip through the wilderness as dead. Now your Jordan River may be a time of crisis that makes you see what things are really important. It may be a trial that leaves you in a place so low that you have to look up to see the bottom. But whatever the motivation, whatever the crisis is in your life, that Jordan River of your life is the place where you decide that you are absolutely sick. Hear me. You have to get to the point here where you realize that you are absolutely fed up with Egypt, with sin, with the world. And you have finally decided, maybe this morning, maybe this January day, that you will align yourself with God's purpose instead of trying to do it your way. And remember when I was here the last time I told you that when I did come back, there would be some of you in exactly the same spot on that same pew, knowing that you're not as close to God as you once were. Do you remember? And I said there's not one thing on the top side of God's green earth that will motivate you until this changes and until you're fed up and you want to see a change in your spiritual life. How are you doing? How many of you are still in exactly the same place on that same pew? And I'm saying to you this morning that you can mildew on that pew. But until you understand here that it has to change, I can come back, Brother Maxie, in another three or four or five or six years, and you will still be there knowing what you should do, but you haven't done it. This morning when you opened your eyes, you filled your lungs with good, clean Texas air, with that good weather that we brought with us, those of us who were visiting here. God gave you another 24 hours. God says, I'm giving the people here this morning another 24 hours. You have been blessed with another 24 hours of life. You are 24 hours nearer the judgment today than you were yesterday. You're 24 hours nearer death today than you were yesterday. And yet we take our souls so casually. Now you cannot change what has happened in your life. You cannot change the hows in your life. The only thing that you can change when you cross over into your promised land is the who in your life. And that who is you. Any good commander, when he possibly can, sends a surveillance detail to learn as much about his adversary as possible, and then you go. It's common sense. Prior to the final arrangements for the crossing of the Jordan, spies were sent. 
They were sent to look out and case Jericho. Their mission was helped by Rahab of all people. And when the preparations were made, the signal was given that the Ark of the Covenant, borne by priests, poor Uzzah, this was borne by priests. It would signal the rising up of the nation of Israel over into the land of Canaan. So many obstacles were ahead, and they knew it. But with the encouragement of Joshua, this nation crossed over the Jordan. The waters had parted for them, and they passed over into dry land. Even beginning students in the Old Testament understand that the placing of these 12 stones simply represented the 12 tribes of Israel, we're told in Joshua 4, verses 2 and 3. Now, here it comes. Joshua gave the reasoning for the placement of these stones, the gathering of these stones. It was for a sign. Now, a sign has some significance, Brother James. This does not repre th this represents Jacksonville State University where you graduated. It is not Jacksonville University, but somebody was gullible enough to get me through there several years ago. This signifies Jacksonville State University. A sign has some significance to it that future generations can see. That's all this means. Joshua takes their minds down the stream of time to all those people who would follow them until Christ comes to claim his own. That when they were asked, what mean ye by these stones would be the realization that these, stone, these souls yet unborn, number one, would see that the stones by some past knowledge had, had been caused by something. And they would know they were to have a continuing significance. And naturally, they would be just a little bit curious about all of it. And the minds of these future generations will be taken back to the history of their nation. This is exciting history reading. To recall the journey to the land of promise and to God guiding them across on dry land. And so these stones will be erected, and that's the centerpiece of this lesson. It would be erected as a memorial unto the children of Israel and to their entry into the land of Canaan. And it would be set up as a permanent thing. We don't have, as did the river crossing Israelites, any land or territory marked as holy ground. We don't have that. We're devoid of feasts. We're devoid of festivals and ceremonies and celebrations except the Lord's Supper, which we'll partake of in just a little while. But there are stones. We have stones today, marks of distinction so that the truth of God can be more easily recognized and so that men can know when they've obediently followed and complied to the Lord's will, they will show that these stones are the features of the Christian system. That's ours today, erected by God through the placing of these things in his word. And next, the remembrance of these things is made stronger by our devotion to what's written within the word of God. Those are our stones of remembrance. Now, some descendant in some far distant time may come across one of these New Testament stones and ask this question. What mean ye, these stones? Here's our challenge. From the youngest to the oldest here. Will we know when they ask? Because of our ignorance of things spiritual, maybe our possible deviation from the truth. Will future generations leave their children in ignorance of the truth? when they're asked. Maybe in the darkness of the endless light of times, someone might be rummaging among discarded things in an attic and find a tract probably written by Perry Cotham. And on that tract is the title, Obeying the Gospel. He has no idea as to the meaning of that language, and so this person in this future day goes to some person that's in a generation behind him and he says, what meaneth this? Will we know enough, will we be a loyal enough to God that they'll be able to get the right answer from us? In a future time, maybe someone renovating a home is cleaning out the kitchen cabinets and they come across some shelf lined with a page from an old gospel paper. And the article that catches the eye is entitled The New Testament Church. He brings this paper to a person from the generation before him. 
what meaneth this? Will that previous generation have been so long in apostasy that they don't have a clue? Folks, I'm talking about us, young and old. What will we pass on on this, our watch, and down the corridors of tomorrow? In a collection of tapes that is now passed on to other hands, someone says, what is this? And they hold up an old-fashioned cassette tape, and they find the title, Baptism, Essential to Salvation. He listens to the tape. He comes to one of the previous generation, and he asks, what is baptism? What meaneth this? A member of the 24th century generation is found browsing around in a secondhand bookstore and discovers a religious volume from our time. One of the great preachers, possibly on the lectureship this week, had authored earlier a publication entitled The Lord's Supper. Now, when this future Inquisitor asks, what kind of supper did the Lord have? That's an unusual phrase. What significance does it have for us now in this advanced technological age? What does it mean to us? Did the Lord have a supper? What does it mean? Will he be able to see that the disciples were to observe with regularity the remembrance of him who gave himself for us? forever. Two men of tomorrow may be speaking of the religious heritage in their families, and one of them seems to recall that his mother and father talked about the churches of Christ not using mechanical instruments of music in their worship service. Mention will be made of the fact that at the time there were strong scriptural arguments against the use of the instruments, and that the one hearing the argument, the one hearing the remarks, may come to one of the previous generations and says, what meaneth this? Has someone not used the instruments back in those days? What were their records? Did they have Bible authority for not using instruments? When these questions are asked of those people in the prior generation, will we be able to give an answer? Will they be able to show the instances of music practiced by these following Christ from Matthew, I think, 26, all the way through James, will be able to show that the action they are in is always vocal music. Always. Some ancient and obscure book detailing trends in religious history unfolds a determination by some people to return to the old paths, whatever that means. And intrigued by the idea, suppose that somebody in that day turns to a person of the preceding generation and he asks this question, what meaneth this, old paths? Were there old paths? Who did they go to to determine whether or not this is true? Where did you go on these old paths? Why didn't they continue in them? If they had them, why did they leave them? And those in the year 2050 in Fort Worth, here, what will they do when they're asked, what mean ye these stones? Young fellows, young men who may be in this audience today at a very early age, will you be able to tell them? I wonder if we remember, if we even make an effort to remember all that God has done for us from creation to 2004. Because you see, this is the way it's always been as far as we're concerned. We happen to be born on the right side of the globe. And all we've had to remember are good things, even through the bad times. One very special blessing that God gave us is the capacity to remember, even the bad things. That's what fleshes us out. How often do we exercise this in remembering him? How often do we remember that in the salvation that he provided for us? You see, Israel was noted for raising up the stones. And it had a memorial elevated in the midst of the Jordan. We're to learn by those events. No. If you'll look at the inscription on the communion table in front of you. This do in remembrance of me. You see, the world's greatest monument neither originated in man's mind 
nor was it designed by some great artist. It isn't even recognized by most historians. You won't find it in a travel magazine. Its picture is not taken regularly. It originated in the mind of God, and it was set up in honor of his crucified son. Please hear me. For about 15 minutes each first day of the week, Christians keep a feast in honor of the one who died for them. It's simple in a very complex way because the cup reminds us of the horror of sin. It caused the Passover lamb to be killed. And the juice reminds us of the price that was paid for the church, everything, the 20th chapter of Acts. And it reminds the partaker of this Lord's Supper, of his baptism, when he was washed in the blood, we're told in the sixth chapter of Romans. And it impresses us with the need to walk in the light continually so that this blood will cleanse us. No, you don't have to go on vacation to see the world's absolute greatest monument. It will come by you in your pew each Sunday morning. That is the world's greatest monument. And I beg you this morning, I beseech you this morning, those of you who remember what I said the last time I was here, to think very, very carefully about your soul. To think very carefully about the souls of those unborn generations in your family line that either will call heaven home or be condemned to hell simply because you did not remember what you should have. And I think the litmus test for us here this morning is to break the mold that we've had for the last several years. Those of us who for some reason or another have decided to follow Satan instead of God. Do you do understand if you know that you need to respond to the invitation call this morning, taking advantage of that cleansing blood, that's all we have. The blood of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that if you know you should, through bringing his name through the dirt, living in a way that a Christian should not live, and I happen to think reproach on the Lord Jesus Christ can be, can be found within a family. Please hear what I just said. You can support or you can discourage someone within your family so that they will be lost or they will find God. And I'm asking you this morning, with every fiber of my being, and respectfully requesting that we stand very, very still as we stand with this good song leader and we sing this beautiful invitation hymn that you pay particular attention to the words, that you don't prepare your children to leave, that you don't get ready to leave yourself, that you don't walk up and down the aisles during the invitation, but that you stand perfectly still and pray fervently that those who need to respond to the invitation call this morning simply place their books down on the pew and on this January day of 2004, you'll always remember when you responded to the invitation call and by the grace of God, you did what that big nosed preacher from Alabama told you to do. Does that make sense to you? Now, for those of you this morning who stand where you are and sing this song as we normally do as a prelude to leaving this building, I happen to think that we can lie in song. If you need to respond, don't filter today. Make this year something different. Don't wait. If you wait, there's one being that's making you wait, and it's not God. So this morning, do something to break that mold. 
to break the cycle. Simply stand up, place your book on the pew, and walk this way and Brother Maxie and I will be down here. And you can leave those doors for a good meal in just a very few moments without a single sin to your charge. And that's the truth. And it's something all of us have had to do. Don't hesitate as we stand. Won't you do that while we stand and sing, please? <laughs>